In the history of American Cosa Nostra, the threat of violence is just as important as its use, and nearly every member and associate in its history is capable. There are individuals, however, who stand out even among their peers in the underworld. These mobsters are the 30 most feared wise guys in American Cosa Nostra. Number 6. Gambino Family Underboss. Agnello, Mr. Neil, De La Croce. Agnello John De La Croce was born on March 15, 1914 in Manhattan, New York to Francesco and Antoinette De La Croce, both of them first-generation immigrants from Italy. He grew up in the Little Italy section of Manhattan and received the nickname Neil, which was just an Americanization of his first name, Agnello. As a youth, De La Croce found work as a butcher's assistant, but times were hard, and he was sometimes forced to supplement his income through petty crime. Little Italy in the 1930s was an enclave for La Cosa Nostra, and it wouldn't be long before the young De La Croce would be noticed by the made men that frequented the social clubs in the area. De La Croce would end up associating with the Mangano crime family, which at the time was one of the five major La Cosa Nostra families in New York, and by the late 1930s, he would become a made member of the family. He would be placed in the crew of his mentor, Armand Tommy Rava, Rava was a powerful capo that reported directly to feared Mangano underboss, Albert Anastasia. His crew would soon become known as the most powerful crew in the family and one of the most feared throughout the city. During these early years, he would marry Lucille Riccardi, and the couple would have three children, Harold, Shannon, and Armand, who was named after the Gambino capo, Armand Rava. Armand Delacroche would eventually become a made man himself years later. Family boss Vincent Mangano began to resent the close relationship Anastasia had with the Luciano administration, namely Charles Luciano and Frank Costello, particularly the fact that they had obtained Anastasia's services without first seeking Mangano's permission angered the mob boss. This and other business disputes led to heated, almost physical fights between the two mobsters. Then, on April 19, 1951, Vincent Mangano went missing, and his body was never found. That same day, the body of Vincent's brother, Philip, was discovered in Jamaica Bay. No one was ever arrested in the Mangano murders, but it is widely assumed that Anastasia had them killed. Anastasia ascended to the position of boss, and with his ascension, the Rava crew gained even more prominence, with Rava becoming the most powerful capo in the family. Delacroche became one of the family's top hitmen, killing multiple people on Anastasia and Rava's orders. On one of these hits, it is alleged that Delacroche dressed as a Catholic priest, which earned him the nickname Father O'Neill. In the mid-1950s, Luciano family underboss Vito Genovese and powerful Anastasia family mobster Carlo Gambino began a high-stakes takeover of the two mob families. On May 2, 1957, gunman Vincent the Chin Gigante shot and wounded Luciano crime family boss Frank Costello outside his apartment building. Although the wound was a superficial one, it persuaded Costello to relinquish power to his underboss Vito Genovese and retire. Genovese would then control the Luciano crime family, which in later years would be named the Genovese family in his honor. Joseph Bonanno later credited himself with arranging a sit-down where he kept Albert Anastasia from immediately taking Genovese to war in response. On June 17th of that year, Frank Scalise, Anastasia's underboss and the man identified as directly responsible for selling family memberships, was also assassinated. According to Valachi, Anastasia approved the hit and subsequent murder of Scalise's brother Joseph after offering to forgive his threats to avenge Frank. With the plot in motion, Carlo Gambino would take over as underboss for the Anastasia crime family. On the morning of October 25, 1957, Anastasia entered the barbershop of the Park Sheridan Hotel at 56th Street and 7th Avenue in Midtown Manhattan. Anastasia's driver parked the car in an underground garage and then took a walk outside, leaving him unprotected. As Anastasia relaxed in the barber's chair, two men with scars covering their faces rushed in 
shoved the barber out of the way, and fired at Anastasia. After the first volley of bullets, Anastasia reportedly lunged at his killers. However, the stunned Anastasia actually attacked the gunman's reflection in the wall mirror of the barber shop. The gunman continued firing until Anastasia finally fell dead to the floor. Underboss Carlo Gambino would take over day-to-day -day operations for the family. However, a faction of Anastasia loyalists led by Capo Armand Tommy Rava were not pleased with the death of their boss. Gambino and Rava would both attend the disastrous Appalachian meeting. However, shortly thereafter, the commission would name Gambino acting boss, and Armand Tommy Rava would allegedly be killed by future Gambino capo Tato Arello on Gambino's orders. Delacroche would allegedly take charge of the crew, and a meeting would be set for Grand Central Station, where the remaining leadership of the Rava faction would meet with Gambino. At this meeting, the plan was to murder the new boss. However, Gambino sent an emissary to the meeting instead, and the Rava crew was told if they would come in, they would be readmitted into the family. Feeling they had no choice, the crew members came in. At this time, the crew was split in two, with Anello Della Croce and Anthony Rizzo each being named Capo. Della Croce would headquarter his operations out of the Ravenite Social Club on Mulberry Street in Little Italy. The Ravenite crew would become one of the top crews in the family, especially when the job was murdered. It also featured some of the most fearsome hitmen in La Cosa Nostra at the time. Men such as Cataldo, Charlie the Animal, Delutro, Joseph Vincent Bisogno, and Anthony Fat Andy Ruggiano. The crew also boasted top-level earners such as Editore Luigi De Curtis, Michael Mike Talley Caeza, and Carmine Charlie Wagons Fatico. To say Della Croce had a strong crew was an incredible understatement. In 1965, Carlo Gambino would remove the aging Joseph Biondo from his underboss position. He would then name Della Croce as his replacement. During these formative years, Della Croce developed a reputation as an ice-cold killer. The news media and law enforcement were just as leery of him as his fellow mobsters. His infamous stare was enough to cause the most hardened individuals to melt in front of him. NYPD Detective Joseph Coffey was quoted as saying, Delacroche was one of the scariest individuals I've ever met in my entire life. Delacroche's eyes were like he didn't have eyes. Did you ever see Children of the Damned? His eyes were so blue that they weren't even there. It was like looking right through him. A reporter described Delacroche in the same manner when asked about the infamous stare. The reporter stated that, His eyes had no color as if his soul was transparent. Detective Ralph Salerno stated that when Carlo Gambino died, if I'd have been asked to place a $10 wager as to who would be his successor, I would have put $10 on the man who was his underboss, Anello Della Croce. Of all the gangsters I've met personally, and I've met dozens of them, in all my years there were only two that when I looked them straight in the eyes, I decided I wouldn't want them personally mad at me. Anello Della Croce was one of those. Carmine Galante was the other. They had bad eyes. They had the eyes of killers. You looked at Della Croce's eyes and you could see how frightening they were. The frigid glare of a killer. Della Croce killed over a dozen people and had dozens more killed on his orders, including some of his own soldiers, and according to Sammy Gravano, his own future son-in-law. Della Croce could be shockingly treacherous as well. He exhibited this when he ordered the execution of longtime enforcer and friend, Anthony Tony Plate Pilate. He allegedly murdered Pilate for seemingly trivial reasons. He did not want to be tried with him because of Pilate's vicious reputation and menacing appearance. The irony of this act was seemingly lost on the already vicious and menacing Delacroche. In 1971, Delacroche was sentenced to one year in state prison on contempt charges for refusing to answer grand jury questions about organized crime. In 1972, he was indicted on federal tax evasion charges. He would be convicted and sentenced to five years in prison. Not long after he was released, Carlo Gambino would pass away shortly after declaring acting boss Paul Castellano as the new boss of the Gambino crime family. Della Croce as underboss was favored to succeed Gambino, however it is believed that Gambino always favored Castellano 
due to their familial connections. Rather than dividing the family by demanding a vote from the Capos, Delacroche avoided conflict and a possible war by accepting Gambino's decision. Delacroche was kept on as underboss and given a free hand controlling the blue-collar rackets and autonomous authority over certain crews. The arrangement seemed to work for the two aging gangsters, however some of the younger members of the De La Croce faction were not pleased with Castellano's ascension. In the mid-1980s, a group within the De La Croce faction led by John Gotti were looking to rebel against Castellano. Many within the group were under threat of death from Castellano for dealing heroin. Delacroach, who at this time was riddled with cancer, would not consent to killing the boss. The respect Delacroche had amongst the Gambino rank and file restrained the rebel faction. It would not be until after his death that Gotti and his allies would move on Castellano to take over the family. On December 2, 1985, Anello Neil Delacroche died of brain cancer at the age of 71. He was buried at St. John's Cemetery in Queens. His death marked the end of a golden era for the Mafia, and during his life he became one of the most feared and respected mobsters in the history of La Cosa Nostra. Number 5. Chicago Outfit Associate Samuel Mad Sam Stefano. Sam Stefano Jr. was born on September 13, 1909 in Streeter, Illinois to Samuel DeStefano Sr. and Rosalie Brasco DeStefano. His parents, who were both born in Italy, immigrated to the United States around 1903. Not long after his birth, Sam DeStefano Jr. and his family moved to Heron, Illinois, where his father worked in the local coal mine. After the labor-related turmoil surrounding the Heron Massacre, the DeStefano family moved north to Chicago's Little Italy. DeStefano Sr., after laboring in the coal mines, found better work as a grocer and eventually as a real estate agent. Rosalie was a housewife who cared for the children, which totaled seven. The couple had three sons and four daughters. DeStefano began a life of crime while still in his teens. He would be arrested for a petty offense and would subsequently escape from jail afterward. DeStefano would be rearrested on September 12, 1926 for the escape. After his release, DeStefano would be arrested a third time in November of 1927 when he and Ralph Orlando were accused of assaulting a 17-year-old girl. The prosecution claimed that on August 19, 1927, the girl was forced into an automobile and driven to a garage where she was sexually assaulted by seven men. Orlando and DeStefano were both found guilty of rape. Orlando was sentenced to 10 years, while DeStefano was sentenced to three. While in prison, DeStefano made connections with powerful gang elements, and upon his release in 1930, joined the 42 Gang, an infamous Chicago street gang led by future outfit boss Salvatore Sam Giancana. In 1932, DeStefano would rob a grocery store. During the robbery, he was wounded by a policeman while escaping. In August of that year, DeStefano appeared at a hospital on Chicago's west side with bullet wounds. He refused to explain what they were from. Then in 1933, DeStefano would be convicted of a bank robbery in New Libson, Wisconsin, and sentenced to 40 years in prison. His sentence was commuted by Governor Julius Heil in December of 1942, and he would be released in December of 1944. DeStefano returned to prison again in June of 1947 for possessing counterfeit sugar ration stamps. For these crimes, DeStefano would be sent to the infamous Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary. While doing time there, DeStefano would make connections with outfit heavyweights Paul Rica and Luis Campagna. DeStefano would be released in 1947, and outfit boss Paul Rica would finance DeStefano's first major loan sharking operation. DeStefano would supplement Rica's investment with his ill-gotten gains from bank robberies, and by the time the 1950s rolled around, DeStefano would be one of the most prominent loan shark operators in Chicago. DeStefano's loan shark victims included politicians, lawyers, and small-time criminals, many of whom paid exorbitant rates of 20 to 25% a week in interest. 
DeStefano would also accept very high-risk debtors, such as gamblers, drug addicts, or businessmen who had already defaulted on previous loans. The reason was simple. DeStefano enjoyed when debtors did not pay on time, since he could then bring them to the soundproof chamber he'd built in his basement and torture them. Other gangsters said the sadistic DeStefano would actually foam at the mouth while torturing his victims. From time to time, DeStefano would also kill debtors who owed small sums, just to scare larger debtors into making their payments on time and in full. DeStefano's cruelty and sadism became legendary. Artie Adler, a local restaurant owner who had been late on juice payments, was brought to Sam's basement. Sam went to work with an ice pick and tortured Adler relentlessly. The pain inflicted on Adler was so great that his heart finally gave out, killing the men. Adler's body was dumped into a sewer near North Sayre in Harlem, on the far west side, and there it stayed, frozen in the sewer, until the spring thaw. The Department of Sanitation got a call in the spring about a backed-up sewer, and that's when Adler's perfectly preserved corpse was discovered. In another story of DeStefano's cruelty, it is alleged that loan sharking victim Peter Capaletti fell behind on his juice payments. Capaletti owed a debt of $25,000 to DeStefano and attempted to run off without paying. For DeStefano, an example needed to be made. Capaletti was caught and brought to Mario DeStefano's restaurant Cicero. He would be stripped naked and handcuffed to a radiator where he was beaten and tortured by Sam for three full days. On the night of the third, DeStefano phoned the members of the Capaletti family and invited them all to a luxurious dinner at the restaurant in the man's honor. That Saturday, when the family showed up, they were fed a multi-course Italian dinner before DeStefano delivered the naked and severely burned man to his mother and family. The family assured DeStefano that the money would be paid. DeStefano's own family was not off-limits either when it came to Mad Sam inflicting pain and degradation. It is alleged by one informant that once, when Mad Sam's wife displeased him, he abducted a black man at gunpoint and then forced his wife to perform oral sex on him. The man was so fearful of getting in trouble, he went to the police and told them the whole story. Neither Sam nor his wife would cooperate, and no charges were ever filed. DeStefano would even accept a contract on his own brother Michael, whose drug habit and other embarrassing behavior stoked the ire of outfit bosses. When questioned about the 1955 murder, DeStefano refused to answer and instead giggled uncontrollably. When investigators tried repeating their questions, DeStefano only laughed harder. Leo Foreman was another victim of Mad Sam DeStefano. Foreman allegedly had the gall to throw the fearsome loan shark out of his office. An enraged Mad Sam immediately plotted for revenge. Foreman would be lured to the Cicero home of Sam's brother Mario by Tony Spilatro and Chucky Cromaldi. Foreman went because he was told that Mad Sam wanted to patch things up between the two of them. Once in the house, Leo Foreman was grabbed and tied up by Spilatro, Mario DeStefano, and Cromaldi. The three then proceeded to beat on Foreman until Mad Sam arrived. After his arrival, Mad Sam decided to beat Foreman with a hammer on his knees and about the head, ribs, and crotch. Sam then stabbed Foreman with an ice pick over 20 times in places that would inflict pain but not cause Foreman mortal injury. When Foreman had sufficiently been tortured, a pajama-clad DeStefano began laughing at the wounded man. According to government witness Chucky Cromaldi, DeStefano screamed and giggled as he admonished Foreman, saying, I told you I'd get you. Greed got you killed. Foreman pleaded for his life as DeStefano shot him repeatedly in the buttocks. DeStefano and his crew watched Foreman bleed and whimper before finishing him off with a butcher knife. Far from letting death spoil their party, DeStefano and the boys then took turns excising chunks of flesh from Foreman's arms. During these years, DeStefano began investing his ill-gotten gains in Chicago real estate. He bought a 24-suite apartment building and used the rent money as legitimate income to supply his next racket, which was bribing and controlling local aldermen, judges, prosecutors, 
and law enforcement officers. By the mid-1950s, DeStefano would brag there wasn't a case he couldn't fix and began offering his services accordingly. His fees ranged from $800 for fixing a robbery case to $1,500 for an assault case. DeStefano allegedly fixed a first-degree murder case for $20,000. DeStefano's arrangements became so routine, corrupt police officers would escort suspects to DeStefano's house. After DeStefano paid off the cops, the suspects would be put on the juice to DeStefano in exchange for his assistance. The FBI began to tighten its surveillance around DeStefano. FBI agent William F. Romer wrote of going to DeStefano's house to question him about mob business, saying that several times DeStefano would walk downstairs in his pajamas, exposing himself. Often DeStefano's wife would serve the agent's coffee, and the agents would comment that the coffee had a unique taste to it. DeStefano would claim that the coffee was made from special Italian coffee beans that his wife brewed. Months later, Romer found out DeStefano had been urinating in the coffee before serving it to the agents. Romer wrote that he could never drink coffee again. In 1965, DeStefano was convicted of conspiracy and sentenced to three to five years in prison. On February 22, 1972, DeStefano was sentenced to three and a half years in prison for threatening the life of mobster-turned-informant Charles Cromaldi, who was also an accomplice in the Foreman murder. DeStefano encountered Cromaldi in the elevator of the Chicago Durskin Federal Building, where he was heard threatening the witness's life. Later, in 1972, DeStefano would also be indicted on federal charges for illegal possession of firearms by a felon. DeStefano and his associates were eventually indicted for the Foreman murder. As in previous trials, DeStefano had created a public spectacle with his bizarre behavior. He demanded to represent himself while dressed in pajamas. He shouted through bullhorns in court and often rambled incoherently. Because of his erratic behavior, his co-conspirators asked for and received permission from the outfit to kill DeStefano. On April 14, 1973, it is alleged that DeStefano was to meet with his brother Mario and an associate, Tony Spilatro, in the garage of his Galewood neighborhood home in the 1600 block of North Sayer Avenue. Before the meeting could begin, Spilatro allegedly entered the lot and shot DeStefano twice with a shotgun, hitting him in the chest and tearing his left arm off at the elbow, instantly killing him. No one was ever tried or convicted in the case. It was a fitting end to the most deranged gangster in the history of Chicago. One associate stated that he once saw DeStefano roll on the floor with spit running out of his mouth, begging Satan to show him mercy, and screaming repeatedly, I am your servant, command me. This type of behavior and his overall deranged and sadistic state of mind made Mad Sam DeStefano the most fearsome man in Chicago and one of the most feared gangsters of all time.